Hey everybody, what's going on? Install Education back for another year. Uh, we're gonna start this year off right with uh, letting you save some money. So two of our favorite uh, people are the Core360 Belt and Human Locomotion, which is Dr. Thomas Shad. So don't forget, if you use the code Gestalt for the Core360 Belt, you get $5 off all belts, except for the ohm track sensors. So Brett, what about what, what are some of the Michaud's favorite, uh, some of your favorite Michaud uh, gadgets? Well, I mean, he's got a he's got a trunk full of gadgets, but I think my my favorite one definitely would be the we I mean, we use the Toe Pro quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, the Toe Pro, and then I think the Varus and Valgus Post have really given people like a nice option if they're not want to take that leap into like a customized orthotic to kind of um, you know a good option for the patient, but also for, to let them kind of like you know bring the power back to the clinician to kind of decide where to post it. And so I, I think those are the two probably ones uh, of Tom's stuff that I love. And of course his tie, I can't get enough of his of his human locomotion. I mean the book is still to this day pure insanity. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Don't forget to use the code Gestalt on both those, the Core 360 belt, and then also Human Locomotion links are in all of our podcasts. And we hope you guys like today's episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, Taylor Premier here with Brett Winchester. Today, we are dipping our toes into the world of functional medicine, Brett. And so this has been a long time coming. Uh, we were just looking for the right person to, to kick us off with this journey. And so uh, today, we're sitting down with uh, Dr. Datis Kazarian. Uh, I first kind of heard the name through Apex, but Brett, you had a little bit more of an intimate relationship with uh, with Datis early on, huh? Yeah. So uh, most most people know that my son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That was probably three years ago. Uh, three to four years ago. And the second he got diagnosed with that, the one name in the world that I knew that my son had to see was, uh, was Datis. And, uh, so there's a little bit of a process to get him to Datis. So I immediately started, you know, all the legwork and the testing that, uh, Datis required for, for him to become a patient. So, uh, my wife and, uh, and my son Wade, we headed out to San Diego and we had just an amazing appointment with Datis. And I would say, for those of you who don't know exactly what functional medicine does, and we'll let Datis comment on this here in a second, but it basically exposes what the actual cause of the problem is. You know, especially if we're dealing with autoimmunity, we you know we have our diagnosis, but then we have this uh, an amalgam of different things that are leading to whatever manifested with uh, with the poor genes or the lifestyle, whatever it might be. So um, I knew just, uh, I mean. Datis, for those who don't know, he is absolutely a legend. I think in the world of functional medicine and chiropractic, if you say D.D. Palmer, in my mind, if we say functional me you know, medicine, we say Datis Kazarian. So, I mean, this guy is, uh, he's the guy. So when, when Wade got his diagnosis, we immediately uh, went out and, uh, and saw him. And uh, it, it was just an unbelievable uh, doctor's appointment. I mean, if you, if you ever want to see how a true physician should act, I mean, I think uh, Datis, uh, he resembles that. I mean, we had a three-hour exam, uh, basically a full neuro exam, uh, really, really good, um, questioning and just really took interest and, uh, really felt, I mean, it's really kind of what Western medicine is kind of missing right now. I mean, I actually felt like that he's truly cared about, you know, what was the cause of, uh, of Wade's issue. And, uh, yeah, and it was just a, it was an unbelievable experience. Beautiful. Well, Datis, do you maybe want to kick us off with, uh, what, what is functional medicine and, and how did you, uh, how'd you kind of transition? You told us right before we came on, you actually started, uh, your career working in sports medicine. Well, I kind of always overlap, but uh, when I first got out of school, I, I did have to pay the bills and, uh, and, and that was a job available to me, but I was always, always doing was functional medicine. But at the time, it wasn't really called functional medicine. It was just really personalized nutrition. And uh, f basically, functional medicine is really the concept of you're trying to improve function. So if you look at medications, medication designed to downregulate, inhibit, block, right? Serotonin uptake inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, uh, protein pump inhibitor, inhibition, inhibition block, inhibition block, inhibition block. Whereas functional medicine is trying to upregulate. So that's the main difference in functional medicine. And functional medicine is also very different, uh, let's say, than a conventional model because it's personalized. It's a personalized medicine approach. Everyone would be treated differently. And, if, and there's a difference between like functional medicine and nutrition therapy and green 
medicine. Uh, so let me kind of help clarify those. So green medicine is like you have a diagnosis and you go, what can I take naturally for that? That's green medicine. So if you have depression, instead of taking you know, Prozac, you would take St. John's wort because same diagnosis and then you just alternate with drugs. So that's what's called green medicine. So that's not functional medicine. And then classical nutrition is like, where's your nutritional deficiency? You must have a problem. So if you have hypertension, maybe you're magnesium deficient. So the theory of basic nutrition therapy is you try to find nutritional deficiencies. deficiencies, And that's not functional medicine. <laughs> so functional medicine is like looking at a condition and an individual patient and then going, what are the triggers? What are the mechanisms that are involved? So for example, if someone has autoimmunity, you know, autoimmunity is linked to let's say dysregulated regulatory T cells, intestinal permeability, like overactive dendritic sites, environmental triggers, uh, pathogenic triggers. And then what we try to do is try to find as many different triggers to change the expression of the disease or just, or simply put to improve their function. So it's not based off the disease. The disease tells us, or the condition tells us what mechanisms may draw, cause that. And then we take a step backwards and see which are specific to the patient. And then we do a treatment plan. And then we're, we usually have like a working diagnosis and we see how they respond. And it's like a process of going through it. But it, the best way to, I think to think about it is like an individualized, personalized approach that's trying to improve physiology and function. It's not based on green medicine and it's not just based on looking for a nutrient deficiency. And why do you think there's such a gaping hole in Western medicine, Datis? I mean, functional medicine, as you, as you just described, I mean, it just sounds like it's the future of medicine and where everything's headed. But up until this point, why do you, why do you think that, you know, the, the world has kind of neglected all of these amazing uh, clinical, clinical pearls? Well, first of all, I'm definitely not anti-medicine. I spent a lot of my time in conventional <laughs> Medical school. We're backing you in a corner here. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The point is that like you have to understand that the way conventional medicine is set up worldwide is it's all based on evidence. And by evidence translates to a clinical trial. And then when you do a a randomized clinical trial, the clinical trial is being designed to be what's called generalizable, meaning for most people. So the purpose of a clinical trial is to have research done that's generalizable to most people, not to an individual. And then the study is, and it's so expensive to run. And then you try to include the least amount of inclusion and exclusion criteria. And, you know, that's why some of these clinical trials are like 10,000 people. They have to do that because when they do a statistical analysis to see what's statistically significant, the effect size of it is so small. They have to get so many people in to statistically capture it, right? Right. If you can show a statistically significant change with 10 people, then the effect of the treatment is magnificent. It's huge, right? So these large clinical trials are done to look for a small effect size that's generalized with the whole population. And if you get two of those, then you can get FDA approval for a drug. And then if you NFD approval a drug, then that gets accepted by insurance companies. And now you have like a healthcare system that's really based on with best intentions. Let's look at evidence and find the best form of evidence for an effect is a randomized clinical trial because of the study design. And then the limitations of that, that it's generalized with the whole population and they're expensive to do. So we get institutions and insurance companies and hospitals that are following those guidelines because you can't, you can't just do random stuff. And that's all great. And that's great. And that translates to lots of generalizable things that help society. But then when we get people that have chronic sickness, they do have individualized issues. And this is where the term individualized personalized medicine comes in. So I don't think intentions are bad in any scenario. I think conventional medicine is always been just trying to follow the evidence and and it's been limited by the fact that it's a randomized clinical trial that's generalizable, which then translates to policy, um, whereas individual patient treatment is different. And, and, this, and the statistical studies would be like Bayesian statistics and N of one data analysis and so forth. And that's not part of drug approval or therapy approval, but it's, but it's a way that researchers are now capturing individualized personalized medicine. So I think as the field of medical research expands, and to doing more of N one trials and more personalized medicine, we may see some of those changes. But for like general healthcare policy and insurance policies, it has to be generalizable. So I think that's why we have these big issues like at the de- at the depth of what's happening. I don't think anyone has bad intentions. I don't think anyone is trying to be one is person is better than the other. It's just and then how they're trained and what environment they get their training in, and that's how they think. And with, you know, it just seems like autoimmunity is at an all time high. I mean, we, I feel like we're diagnosing autoimmune diseases at younger ages. Um, it's yeah. so prevalent now in uh, modern America. And then there's parts in the world that deal, you know, very little with autoimmunity. What is the modern day American doing wrong to where we have such an influx of diagnoses of uh, 
autoimmune disorders. Right. Well, and, and it's kind of to connect that back to the point we we're making earlier about conventional medicine and functional medicine. And then when you have chronic diseases where the variable, there's mul- it's a multivariate model of disease, meaning there's some genes that can turn on at some point, but many, many different genes can be expressed to tr- express that autoimmune disease to turn on. So it's not like one related factor, right? So um, there's lots of things that can turn on, for example, celiac disease. Like they found like if someone gets exposed to a parvovirus, they can have their celiac disease genes turned on now they have celiac disease. And there's many other things that turn on, let's say type 1 diabetes or Hashimoto's, environmental chemicals, different pathogens and infections. They've all been there in certain gene types and the right combination and environment. The gene type plus environment becomes a phenotype and the autoimmune disease comes apart. That, that turns on. So what happens is when you have chronic diseases that have a multivariate model of onset, Right, it's not like you have bronchitis, you have bacterial infection, antibiotics. It's not, it's not linear. It's, it's it's not one one variable, but when it's multivariate, um, they tend to not work in a generalizable model, and that's where personalized medicine comes in. And we have most of the chronic diseases like we're facing in society today are multivariate models, and they don't respond to a single drug because it's not one variable. So they end up suff- you know, suffering in, in the healthcare system, confused about what to do. And practitioners that can incorporate more of a personalized, life, personalized approach than whether it's functional medicine or something else tend to have some good benefits, some, some better outcomes with them than just like a generalizable drug that there's very few options for. I mean, there's like corticosteroids, biologics, and mm-hmm. that's about it, for autoimmune disease. So I think what's, and then to answer your question, what I think is triggering all these, these different uh, autoimmunities is, uh, you know, the combination of um, lack of sleep, high amounts of stress, chemical exposure, and, and things we're not really in control of. Like many of the autoimmune disease patients I work with, they, they eat well, they exercise, they do everything they're supposed to do, but they still have the expression of disease. And um, there's just so many variables and factors that, can turn on these chronic diseases that we're not we're not aware of, and they tend to all just accumulate. The, the term they use in autoimmune journals is the perfect storm. Sure. Autoimmune disease has so many variables that all ended up catching up at the same time, and that creates the perfect storm. So, whether it's some intestinal permeability from how food products are made, whether it's some of the sig- significant amounts of pollutants in uh, the air in, in dense cities, combination of all those factors. At different susceptibilities that a person's lifespan can then turn the genes on for an autoimmune disease. And unfortunately, autoimmune diseases are one of those diseases where once the genes turn on, um, they really don't have a way to turn it off. They can just decrease the expression of the gene, the phenotype of the gene. So then would you use the term then remission? Because I think, uh, you know, with me doing uh, functional medicine, we have functional medicine here. We have a lot of patients that... um, you know, I mean, the patient would think they've cured themselves, but it sounds like you're saying the patient's basically in remission or the genes are not expressing themselves anymore. And I think in Western medicine, it's it's almost like you get a diagnosis of Hashimoto's or Graves or uh, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever it might be, and you're kind of left to, to believe that, well, you know, this is just how it's going to be. You're going to be taking methyltrexate if it's RA for the rest of your life. So can you explain how what, you know, what you've kind of created and what you do is how we... Uh, you know, would you call it remission when these patients are doing well without medication? What is the actual term or process that you would you would call it then? So, the, so there isn't an there isn't an official term for remission, other than the most common thing is that they don't have symptoms or their lab tests are no longer showing positive antibodies. Right. So, so you can use one of those two terms, and uh, remission just. Uh, um, is a state where they figured out the, the right variables to change the expression of the disease. And that's what we're always trying to do in a functional medicine approach. And the word cure is not. That's a dangerous word. <laughs> for, for, for autoimmune disease in particular, you know, and, and I, and for me, like whenever I hear someone says, Oh, I, we know how to cure autoimmune disease. I'm like, you're, you're not in the trenches with real people. You're like living in a little fantasy world because they're mis- misinterpreting remission as, as a cure. Right. Right. So what do you think, um, you know, how many people that you and I are seeing, if we were just able to convince them to, you know, eat a paleo diet or clean up their diet a little bit, how many people would get better with that alone versus how many people, you know, do that the, in your experience, but then they also, as you were kind of stating before, they also need this next level of, of treatment or functional medicine. 
It's a good question. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at the statistics from the Autoimmune Disease Related Association, they're saying one in uh, one in twelve to twenty women have an autoimmune disease worldwide that may not know they have the diagnosis, and that's like full blown autoimmune disease. But before you get to autoimmune disease, you still have autoimmune reactivity—a period of where you have symptoms and reactions and positive antibodies, but not clear enough to be diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. In order to be diagnosed with autoimmune disease, you have to have the gland destroyed, like you have to have your insulin levels drop for type one, or you have to have your thyroid levels not work and be hypothyroid, or you have to have severe RA where you have joint deformity. But on the way there, for some people, it can take many years and many years and many years and they're having autoimmune reactivity and they're not even being accounted for in the statistics of 10 to 12, one out of 10 to 12, let's say women, it's more common women than men. And men, it's statistics are like 20, one out of 25 to 40, uh, it tends to be hiring women. No one really knows exactly why. Obviously, estrogens and hormones are the thought is the main thing, but there's other variables besides those. And um, how many of them respond to an autoimmune paleo diet? And are, are these questions, it's tough to say because not all autoimmune disease, every autoimmune disease patient is very unique and there's molecular mimicry. So one of the studies we did with type 1 diabetes was we went and looked at cross-reactive foods, which foods directly have molecular mimicry, where the antibodies of the food protein can also react with the target tissue of the autoimmune disease. And we did that for type 1. And I think we we went through that when we talked about weight, but uh, we found when we finished that study, we checked 204 foods in the lab. We checked for cross-reactivity molecular mimicry with, with all these foods, and we found uh, of the 20 foods half of them were on the low glycemic index. And we actually published the paper and said, is the low glycemic index appropriate for type 1 diabetes? Because it's not about low glycemic. It's the fact that these protein foods that are typically healthy because low glycemic are actually causing cross-reactivity. Right. And and um, so when you say like autoimmune paleo or like paleo diet, it depends. Uh, for, for a lot of people with autoimmunity, like an autoimmune paleo diet is a de- there's at least antigenic, but sometimes there's still foods on the autoimmune paleo that they have molecular mimicry with. And we did that with Hashimoto's. We just study, we broke down all the cross-reactive sites with the target protein for Hashimoto's and published that. But um, I would say a majority of people will probably have some sense of relief in autoimmune paleo diet if they have autoimmunity, but there are still going to be some that don't. And some of that may be related to the fact that cross-reactivity specific to even foods that seem healthy on the autoimmune paleo diet. Yeah. And that's the point I was going to make. And I mean, we learned this uh, with some of Wade's blood work and, and then others as I've been using the Cyrex uh, panel that, you know, some of these foods that you would think are very healthy, these people are actually having an immune response to. And uh, the one thing you talked to us about when we were out there is, even like the cooking uh, preparation, you know, the difference between raw food and cooked food of the same food can even change how your body might be reacting to that food from that food from a immune response. Exactly, and that's that's a it's another variable when it comes to like triggers for autoimmunity and food. So cooking changes the structure of the protein, and then it becomes less or more antigenic. So you can have cooked or for example, like tuna, cooked tuna versus raw tuna are totally different antigens. So you could have someone that reacts to raw tuna and they have sushi and then the autoimmune disease flares up, but when they have cooked tuna, they're okay with it. Uh, so that's, that's a fascinating thing about it. And there's also another study that was published where they showed not only that, but when foods get cu- combined together th- during the cooking process, they can become more or less antigenic. So they did studies where they looked like, the, they took like pepperoni and and wheat and dairy and checked each one of those individually. And then they took pizza and grinded it up and put it into a dish. And there's a higher reaction to pizza than it was to any of the individual proteins themselves. So as foods combine, the proteins change and then proteins inter- interlink. So the reality of it is it's uh, it's it's more, it's very complex and and this is sometimes where food testing is very useful because it can help you find some things but other times it's like if you know that you eat at this this food at this restaurant and you react it just may be the ingredients that are combined that are changing that protein or the antigen and you have to listen to your body so there's always a little bit of like elimination provocation uh, that you have to always be aware of Food testing antibodies for reactions to which 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 levels of antibodies go with certain food proteins is very useful to help narrow down the list. 
But sometimes even when you do that, there's a variable clinically of how foods combine together when they're cooked. But I mean, that is it Cyrex Array 5 that looks at that or is it 10? I forget which. That, so food combinations together is not even commercially available. Oh, okay. So um, it could totally di- it could be totally different from, let's say you there's like a Thai dish someone eats. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> and the way they use their sauce, the way everything adds up, it's different. Right. So do you yeah. think then, I mean, since it's it's really, it, it, in the end, it's only a couple hundred dollars. I mean, do you feel like this testing is something that everybody should go through for the most part? Or do we leave do we leave this only for the most susceptible people that have a history of autoimmunity? You know, when I come up with the concept of testing in, in, in a clinical setting, a real-life setting, it's always like, what's, what is it worth to you? What's the benefit? What's the cost ratio? You know, um, I don't know. I think if you're suffering, for sure it's worth it. If you're not suffering, and if it's not a value to you, how do you convince someone to do it? You know, I remember having a really, really sick patient once, and uh, they were really struggling, and we're like, we just needed some testing done to figure out what direction to go. They're like, I can't, I can't afford it. And then like, they were just, they just planned a trip to Hawaii, just had bought like a new purse, and I was like, okay, and I was really conscious of that because I, I was out of school and I had no money. I'm going, wow, they must be doing really well. And I'm like, what do you mean you can't afford a few hundred dollars in testing? No, no, no. And it was just the value of like what they were. And I go, man, right. if I was, I was suffering that bad, I wouldn't, I wouldn't value like a purse or a trip to Hawaii or something as much as I would some of the testing. So everyone's a little bit different. Um, I mean, ideally, it'd be nice to have testing on every single person and <laughs> get as much information as possible. Well, it's safe to say. I mean, I think you would agree with what I'm about to say, but I'm curious to hear what your response is. You are, I mean, you got to row with the oars you're born with. So you have your, you know, your genes that you're born with, but then you have your lifestyle, your diet, and your other things that essentially, you know, would potentially manifest whatever your bad genes would be. So I'm assuming that, you know, if we're just talking about the diet, since we are right now, you know, if you're eating a bunch of foods that are causing immune response in your body, then you are, you're up in the ante, if you will, that that would potentially manifest itself because you're basically creating the perfect storm, as you said before, for that to to manifest. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. And also I would say it's important for people to realize the genes you're born with don't express all the day of your birth. Like many autoimmune diseases turn on at age 30, age 40. So then people are like, well, I've never had problems before my whole life. I used to always drink a glass of milk. And you're like, yeah, well, <laughs> that's different. <laughs> you know, the gene expressions you have at age 30 are not the same you had when you were 12. And there's a lot of things that are not the same anymore. So yes, genes are a factor that can be expressed into like autoimmune diseases or other types of you know conditions, but they do turn on at different times at different lifespans throughout the lifespan for people. Yeah. And back to the point, as far as uh, remission goes, do you think, for example, if you're working with a patient who has Hashimoto's and let's just say their thyroid proxies, antibodies are a thousand, is one of your goals to continue to chase that number down? Or is that not necessarily your, your goal in a case like that when you're dealing with autoimmunity? What I'm asking is, is the number in the, uh, like the th- thyroid proxies, antibodies, is that in, you know, um, Indicative of healing. Yeah, exactly. Like, so are we, are we trying to get that number back into normal range? And then if we do, then the patient is uh, not expressing or they're in remission or when you're working with a patient with Hashimoto's, is that really not your, not your objective? So we have to remember a couple of things uh, with that specific question. Like let's say TPO antibody as an example, it could be any antibody. Let's just say it's TPO. Um, the antibody itself doesn't destroy anything. All the antibody does is tag to the tissue. And then what destroys the tissue once the antibody is attached to it are natural killer cells and T cells. So the antibody binding to it is humoral immunity. And then the cytotoxic immunity is what actually destroys the tissue. So if someone has a very high antibody count, but their cytotoxic T cells are not as strong, even though antibodies are high, they're not getting much destruction. Right. So someone else could have very low antibodies, just a little bit of antibodies higher. Instead of 1,000, they're 100 points higher, right? Let's say they're 200 or something. And let's say that the reference range is, let's say, 100 or 50, whatever. They're at least a little bit up. Uh, every lab will have a different reference range based on what technology and testing they're using and how they validated their tests for Clio. But uh, um, they could have less antibodies, but really reactive natural killer cells and T cells. They're having severe amounts of destruction but their antibody count doesn't look as bad as someone else. Right. So 
So antibodies one part of the picture. Now, statistics, uh, studies had, have shown if you measure the antibody with the person and you get them down from their baseline, that is an indication of remission, but only only for that person's baseline level comparison. And it has to be done with the same lab. Like you can't do one with Quest and one with LabCorp. Mm -hmm. They're not measuring things the same way. They're all doing different assays. They all submit their assays and how they're doing it. There's different reagents. There's different sources they can use. There's different temperatures they can use. There's different variables they can use in their testing. So they don't equate from one lab to the next. So if someone does something with, let's say, Quest, and then gets another test lab corp, and they're better or worse, you, you almost can't even use that information. Right. So do you still have a place for LabCorp and Quest? Are you still using those entities? Or? Yeah, that's yeah. Well, my most ordered tests are routine lab work. Right. I don't, I don't, uh, I have more routine lab Well, work. and you have insurance coverage with those and yeah. <laughs> no, no. I just have the uh, people just pay cash. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, Cause you have a separate deal kind of arranged. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of labs in LabCorp and, and co-ops and different sources where if people pay cash, uh, for the testing, it's much cheaper. I mean, the labs themselves are having difficulties getting paid by insurance companies. So they love to get cash accounts. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge movement right now, like just absolutely a crusade, if you will, on this ultra longevity thought, like that human beings can live to be up, you know, you hear some people say 160, 120, um, seems very unrealistic. But so what are your thoughts as far as lifespan and, you know, what what is actually possible and uh, how much garbage is actually out there as far as like ultra longevity? Well, the paper published Nature Medicine, I, th I think it was Nature Medicine, uh, that was very reliable, said the human potential is up to 120 years, assuming physiology is working. doesn't mean they don't have morbidity up until 120 years. So there's a concept of like uh, how, how old you are, but how are you suffering all the way there? So if, you get, if you're at age 50 and you have illnesses and you can be aged to 100, right, you become a centenarian, but the last 50 years were terrible, that's different. Right. So longevity medicine, so – Clearly, uh, research has shown each generation is living longer, and they're saying. And I just read a paper because I'm actually, I just I'm teaching a course this weekend on longevity medicine, so I've been reading all the <laughs> research on it. Timely, right? Uh, but uh, uh, it's pretty clear that all the data is showing that if you if you were born in 2000 or or past the year 2000, there's a very likely chance you're going to be a centenary. Right, but. You also have no change in the fact that you're going to have morbidity at an earlier age than other people, or you're going to have chronic illness sooner. So there's a there's a concept of like here's a life span, like a lifespan, right? And morbidity is when you start to get a disease. Let's say if it starts halfway, that's terrible. So they want to say you want to shift it to the right. So a big part of longevity medicine is let's shift your morbidity to the right and also have you live longer, not just live longer while you're suffering. Sure. Right. So that's, right. that's the main problem. And it's actually a big problem right now for the, our, uh, for the generations that are elderly now because they're getting dementia and cognitive decline early and they're living to be 80, 90 and the financial costs. Oh, yeah. All by family to 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 take care of them is is really stripping them of like their own the you know their retirement because they're taking care of their parents or their kids' college fund and it's becoming a big issue. What what does functional medicine have to offer for for the neurodegenerative diseases? Is it? I mean, and I know the answer because this is a big part of what you do. But what is not being done? You know, currently in Western medicine that could be helping these patients that are are either having a diagnosis like Alzheimer's or potentially have the genes to manifest Alzheimer's. Well, so there's an entire field of science, uh, legitimate science, not like weird science. pseudo, yeah. <laughs> Well, geroscience. And geros when I mean by that, I mean there's academic institutions that have departments in geroscience. There's journals on geroscience. And geroscience is the field of studying what's happening to people as they're getting older. And the theory of geroscience and the philosophy of geroscience is that there's molecular changes that take place that then lead to all the diseases. And it's not really diseases independent of each other. So they say there's like these hallmarks of aging. Like you get mitochondrial dysfunction. You get senescent cells, which means cells only go through cell division. You get... Uh, Protein buildups, like protein aggregation, like Alzheimer's disease has protein, beta amyloid, cataracts, has a different serotonin protein, sugar protein in their eye, you know, uh, 
different types of like sarcopenia has muscle fiber mass. So they, they can't grow. So they just think there's like eight hallmarks of aging and they go, you can explain every single disease they, in problems of aging. If you do histology studies and you look at that. So their theory is like, you should just have to change the expression of these hallmarks of aging and you would prevent these diseases, whether it's cognitive decline or Alzheimer's. And if you look at it, it's really turning on these longevity genes like mTOR and sirtuin genes and turning AMPK that have been published. And it all comes back to everything everyone already knows. It's like you need, uh, if you do physical exercise, that increases your longevity genes. And then studies show that you have to, the more cardiovascular fitness you do get, you have greater longevity. You have less oral cause mortality. So if you run a mile in whatever amount of minutes, if you can if you can reduce that time, you can have increased mortality. So the more fit you are, that makes a big difference. They're finding if you have more muscle mass, like muscle mass is huge. They found if you're underweight, you have the same risk as being obese. So if you don't have muscle mass, especially when you get to age 50, you have significant risk. Um, you know, what about blood it, sugar? You hear, you know, everybody talks about yeah, blood they, sugar regulation. Yeah, that's part of the hallmark of aging called nutrient sensing. And, and these all come to what's called resilience. So the best way to look at aging and like you look at centenarians and how centenarians are different than everyone else is very clear. They have better resiliency than other people. And we say resiliency, we mean blood sugar resiliency, immune resiliency, psychological resiliency, physical resiliency, sleep resiliency, stress resiliency, toxicological resiliency. So there's all these different forms of resiliency, right? So if you need 10 hours of sleep to function now and you didn't need that you know, a few years ago, uh, you've lost some of your sleep resiliency. So now you need more sleep. If now you eat some carbs and you totally crash, your blood sugar resiliency has gone down. Now, if you work out, it takes you twice as long to recover. Your physical physical stamina resiliency has gone down. So one of the easiest way to determine if you're getting older is to look at your resiliency. And if you're having healthy aging or what your biological age is, your resiliency is maintained. And for people that have uh, become centenarians and shift to the right and don't have morbidity, they have the highest degree of resiliency and more so in all these fields. And even psychological resiliency, the, the key thing studies have shown with centenarians is the Problems come, they're like, okay, we'll get through it. No problem. Mm. And and people that are like, this is this is this is terrible. Life sucks. This is all I can focus on right now. They don't live as long. I've also so, heard uh centarians when they like they do the launch of the studies on them, it, they also have uh better relationships than yeah. yeah. So that you know, better marriages, better, you know, a friend network. And no yeah. one really talks about, you know, the importance of that. But in the blue zones, I think they've kind of shown that you yeah. know, this this sense of community dancing, you know, hanging out with each other, as it turns yeah. out, is actually important. There was a study done and they looked at <clears throat> social relationships and all cause mortality and they found that so having healthy social relationship is is impactful for all cause mortality as being a smoker or being obese. Wow. Right. So if you didn't have social relationships, it would be as if you're like a smoke like smoker all day. That's how serious it was. And then they also, there's a large study published in Journal American Medical Association Open Network uh, a couple of years ago, and they found a sense of purpose has a huge impact on all cause mortality. And they found the stronger the person's sense of purpose, the longer they live. So like resiliency and all cause mortality or things. And then you come back. So what do we do about it? What can functional medicine do about it? How do we live longer? What's still longevity medicine? Ultimately it's resiliency. And then like what builds resiliency? What builds resiliency is hormesis. Hormesis being stressed to the system. And then your body adapts and becomes more efficient to it. Right. And then how many ways can you do hormesis? You can do caloric restriction hormesis where people do time restricted feeding or fasting that turns on these longevity genes. So you act and get more resiliency throughout your body. You can have um, uh, physical exercise resilience, whether it's cardiovascular resiliency or just muscular strength resiliency, temperature resiliency. So cold plungers are very popular now. Yeah. Cold, cold plunges actually release uh, cold shock proteins. Cold shock proteins or DNA binding proteins. They actually bind to RNA and DNA and repair it. I mean, it's no drug or supplement that has been shown to do that. Uh, oh. And then like saunas, lots of studies done in saunas where it also, again, activates hormesis, right? Temperature tolerance and how you can handle sauna. That activates uh, heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins promote autophagy, so you clear the debris. So you don't get the beta amyloid plaques like Alzheimer's disease. You know, you, you, know, you reduce those quite, you know, aggregating protein buildups that we have. And another major concept um, that's associated with that 
in the field of geroscience and where functional medicine, these concepts apply for longevity, is this, this concept called inflammaging. I don't know if you've heard of this. Yeah, Dave Seaman always talks about it. Yeah, inflammaging yeah. is 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 a, is a you know field of study where they find that as we get older and we have more cellular damage, the more cellular dam- damage we have from inflammation, oxidative stress, the more of these dead proteins and protein aggregates we have, and then they're just sitting in our cells and their macrophages are trying to clean them up, and this creates inflammation all over the body. So as we age, we get more inflammation, we get older, and then this really how do you get rid of how do you get rid of that? Right, and really the main thing is autophagy. And then when you look at autophagy, if you really look at the, and it's all based on animal research, we don't have really great human research on autophagy, but um, fasting. And it's it, in these animal studies, like you have to go two to three days to fasting. You're not going to do it from like time restricted feeding for 18 hours. So when you have patients that have inflammation or cognitive decline, we try to improve the resiliency, whether it's temperature resiliency or exercise resiliency, or strength resiliency, or get him into fasting for two to three days and do several rounds of that, maybe 20 rounds of that in the next six months to start cleaning up their debris. So like in functional medicine, we, the way you might treat someone with Alzheimer's disease or someone with just chronic pain and inflammation is we'll incorporate those concepts of geroscience. So we could do sauna, we could do cold plunges, we can have them try to increase their VO2 max, have them improve their strength. And then we also make sure that they don't exceed their resiliencies because that makes them worse. So if they need eight hours of sleep, they got eight hours of sleep, they can't do six. And if they have a certain amount of carbs that make them crash, then we have to limit that. And then as we try to build a hormesis at a level where they can respond to it and not crash, that's really a complete emergence of geroscience and functional medicine overlapping each other. So then I think I hear you saying then the whole intermittent fasting thing, which which might be beneficial, but no autophagy is actually occurring in a if you're just eating in a six hour window, you actually need a two to three day fast to be able to have those results. Yeah, so we're definitely again, if you look at the long the problem with longevity in medicine is like it's really done on worms, mice, dragonflies, and <laughs> there's been one fasting study now done on on uh, monkeys. Okay. Um but none because you, you, you can't cut someone's tissues up and see if the protein aggregation has gone up in human studies. So we're, so we're never going to see them. We're not going to see these studies. We have to understand the limitations of medicine, ethics, and research in humans and so forth. And then also lifespan issues. I mean, you can't, how long can you wait to see if these things change over a period of time with, light, with, with, with organisms that have lower lifespans? But yeah, it seems like when you're sleeping, you're for sure turning on autophagy. Right. So, like, sleep is critical. So, you have to sleep to turn on autophagy. And that's, you know, one of the theories of, like, why do we get tired and have to fall asleep? Well, we get tired and have to fall asleep because we have all these cellular demands mm. <laughs> that have to kick in, which which require lots of energy. And your brain needs to shut down for that to happen because you only have so much resources. So, then you get tired and then your cellular processes, like autophagy, turn in when you're sleeping to get rid of that debris. So, if someone has a sleep disorder, sleep problem, they're not going to use much autophagy. That happens for years and years, years to get more protein or, you know, they call it garbage aging, all these garbage dead cells that have been removed that cause inflammation in their body. And uh, the other only option is when they go into fasting. And if you look at the autophagy states, I mean, autophagy really turns on day two or three. Now, time-restricted feeding can definitely impact, like when people like fast for 18 hours and have a six-hour eating window, that can for sure impact insulin resistance and improve cognitive function and do lots of great things. And there's some degree of autophagy there, but when you're like really trying to deal with a disease of protein aggregation, like Alzheimer's or cataracts or uh, those types of diseases, you need you need uh, two or three-day fasting. And do you think that's like a paleontologist view on – That, you know, as a hunter gatherer, you know, we didn't have, you know, access to food. And therefore, the reason that we do well with fasting is because of maybe scarcity and and things like that. Is that is that why you feel like that is is kind of like a primal reason why that that is the way it is? I I don't know. But I mean, I've heard the same things. Like, yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, Yeah, it sounds attractive. Yeah, (laughs) it sounds sounds that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. But I just know clinically the incorporation of it is, is totally different. Right. So we'll have people that have inflammation and chronic aging and even people that have cognitive decline. And then um, we'll basically have them do a three day fast to figure out how to do it. Maybe they start with the one day, they work into three days, then they get the hang of it. And then we might have them do that once every two weeks. And is that no coffee, no tea? Is that just strictly a water fast? Or? So the only thing when we're trying to promote autophagy, the only thing we're worried about is protein throwing them off. Okay. 
So we're okay with uh, the, the amounts in coffee and tea. There's still a little bit of coffee and like, like, but doesn't. And the way you know if it's throwing them off is they get out. Of we can do this. <laughs> so like a bone broth may be too much for some people. Is it four to five calories? You see some people just drink bone broth and their their ket- their ketones immediately are off. They're just right. no longer there. So they that will throw someone out of autophagy, theoretically. A lot yeah. of we get them wrong. A lot of a lot of autophagy and fasting is is theoretical based on translatable information to animals, right? Mm-hmm. But when you're trying to cover all your bases and go, this person's going to suffer for three days, just just pass, pass on the bone broth. <laughs> right. Tea's okay, coffee's okay, water's okay. Even taking uh, ketones, like beta-hydroxybutyrate exogenous ketones, um, they don't throw people out of a fast. Mm-hmm. So we'll have people take like ketone salts and salt and water. And Is there uh, a brand you like of the exogenous ketones? They're, they're all made by like the two two main manufacturers in the whole country. Like people just buy them from their source and then relabel them. I don't think there's one brand that's better than the other. Uh, but once they get the hydro, once they get the ketones, um, that'll stop them from crashing, getting tired. So a lot of times people will go into let's say for for inflammaging regions or for reasons to try to slow down their degenerative inflammatory processes, or if they have a cognitive disorder, or let's say there's someone who's got an injury that's not healing. If you get a if you get a 45 year old male or female in your office, there's a strong chance to have inflammation. <laughs> <laughs> right, like 100 percent chance. 100 percent. Well, you had a question. And, well, to the point where let's just say it's clinically caused them to not respond to normal care. There's people that don't respond to normal care, like in a functional medicine model. We see someone come in and their body hurts and their joints hurt and they don't recover. We go, okay, well they're inflamed. It's pretty obvious. Everyone knows they're inflamed. And then like in a functional medicine model, we're like, okay. Well, what's their food sensitivity? Let's find out if they have any reactions to foods. Let's see if they have any environmental chemical reactions. Let's go and uh, check to see if the prostaglandins are in balance. How much good essential fatty acids are getting in your diet? Let's look at your diet intake. Let's make sure it's not inflammatory. And we'll go through all that. It's like, yeah, still in pain. Okay, let's have you fast for three days. Oh, I feel a little bit better. Let's have you repeat that 20 more times in the next six months. Wow, this is amazing. Hmm. So... Inflammation is 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 definitely translatable into chronic pain, chronic pain, chronic pain. Patients that don't recover in in uh, sports medicine worlds, but also those inflammation things that they're seeing manifest in their muscles and their injuries and ability to recover are happening in their brain. I mean, they're, they're causing expressions in Alzheimer's disease. They're causing some degree of fibrosis in the liver. They're causing some degree of you know osteoclast, osteoblast changes in their bones. I mean, it's it's systemic. Sure, they're just seeing it because that's what they're pushing. And they're feeling it. <laughs> and then uh, on that note, do you, what's your favorite way of testing for those ketones? Are you still using urine? Are you doing blood? What, what's uh, as far as a tracking? I just use a blood ketone meter. Got I, it. I, I just use Keto Mojo. Got I it. Think it strips are good. The and then on that track, you were talking about, uh, you kind of just barely touched on it, but what about, uh, where does that fall with concussion patients or head trauma, TBI, stuff like that? Does it change at all? Or is it similar fasting periods uh, with supplementation or, or how does that all fall? Can I, can I change the question a little bit? Just cause I think it's like in our world, you know, we see a concussion patient and in two days, one kid is perfect and you basically have the exact same injury and it's protracted over 10 months. And like, I think we, you know, we all struggle with, why is that? I mean, is it an immune response? Like, wh- what do you believe, Datis, is the reason why some of these cases are just so difficult? And then someone can have massive head trauma and they have nothing. Oh, I can tell you. I mean, this is this is the world I've been living in. For <laughs> uh, and tell you what's been published on it and how we've been applying that information. And, and the first thing you have to understand is when there's an injury to the brain, the, first of all, there's two types of cells in the brain, neurons and glial cells, right? Specifically microglial cells. Um, and we have, you know, astroglial cells for the blood brain barrier, but they're, they're also involved. But microglial cells are the ones that create the inflammatory response. So when you get a brain injury, um, these microglial cells get activated and there's, there's something called an M1 state and M1, M2 state. M1 state's inflammatory and M2 state's anti-inflammatory. So initially when there's an injury, the brain has to clean up the debris. Right. So there's been some shearing to the neurons, there's been some injury to the neurons, there's been some impact, there's been some edema that's damaged the structure of neurons. Those neurons are no longer functional. So the microglial cells are like the macrophages that clean up the debris of the brain. So these these glial cells then go in and start cleaning it up. But there's a phenomenon that happens in brain injury, which is called glial priming, which these glial cells, they actually change your anatomical shape. Um, 
and they become this sort of ramified with legs, they become amboid and they stop moving and they stay right there and they stay in an M1 inflammatory state forever. Dude. And they keep activating other uh, glial, they keep activating surrounding glial cells. So they get turned on, they get turned on, and you get that persistent inflammation there. This persistent inflammation then, you know, can lead to things like chronic traumatic encephalopathy 10 years later, where they have Alzheimer's symptoms and other expressions, and the symptoms get worse. But the interesting thing is, is a couple key points about that. The injury itself isn't the only variable. How prime those glial cells are before injury can determine the outcome of the response. So if you have someone who's already has neuroinflammation, right? Let's take an adult. They're a smoker. They're pre-diabetic. They have high insulin levels. They have high insulin free radicals in their system. Their glial cells are already primed by those inflammatory triggers. So systemic inflammation activates them. They get a injury that another person gets the exact same degree of injury to the brain, but their glial cells are not primed. The one that has prime glial cells or inflammation before there is more prone to have their cells get primed forever and all the surrounding tissue and stay inflamed and have a greater outcome, I mean, well, maybe not a greater, but poor outcome, the ones that aren't. So it's not just about how hard you hit your head, it's about the state of the glia before the trauma. So you could have some people, uh, like give an example, that was a friend of mine, she had phospholipid autoimmune disorder, she has antibodies thrown phospholipids, so you know, the immune system attacks her brain. And I remember she was on a trip and she bumped her head getting out of a car, and then she was basically um, concussed, from simply getting out of a car, hitting her head, she was dizzy. She didn't function. In the next six months, her autoimmune disease flared up. She it took her a year to recover. From a typical head blow, most of us would have, you know, just not being careful and getting out of a car. But her brain was already so inflamed that the trauma, even though it was minor, had a significant impact. So that's one variable. And the other variable is once these glial cells turn on and get primed, they stay primed and they stay there. And that's why symptoms will be exactly where the areas are. So if like they injured the frontal lobe, when they get systemic inflammation, let's say the systemic inflammation is coming from a food protein. Let's say they're dairy intolerant. So the dairy and their inflammatory response goes up. Those inflammatory responses then turn on the prime glial cells in the frontal lobe. So now they have focused attention concentration issues. Wow. If someone had a cerebellar injury, they hit the back of their head, they may eat dairy and now they get dizziness and vertigo and nausea is activating those brain centers. Someone else has their auditory cortex injured and now they get tinnitus every time they eat dairy. So you can almost like, hey, what did you, do? what happened that was inflammatory and what were your symptoms? And you can just like, oh, you had a brain injury here. Because <laughs> you can, you know, once you know the regions yeah, of the wow. brain and then you can do a physical exam and identify like that's off. And then now, you know, like those systemic inflammatory triggers are activating these glial cells. And that takes us to like, how do you get rid of these glial cells? You got to turn on autophagy. <laughs> Right. And you have to have them go to three days of fasting. <laughs> and the reason we don't go past three days is because they lose muscle mass. And 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 muscles are now found to be just like another endocrine gland signaling agent. They release myokines. And myokines modulate the immune system. They stimulate the brain. So the more muscle mass you have, the more protective they are. <laughs> so we don't want someone to do extended fasting and then lose muscle mass because you need as much muscle mass as you can. And that's a whole other field of, of uh, research coming out is the uh, the impact of these these messenger proteins or muscles called myokines. So we want them to promote autophagy, but not lose muscle mass. We want that efficient myokines. Now there's research coming out showing like people that are obese, but if they have high amounts of muscles, their myokines are preventing them from having metabolic syndrome. So when they get these blood works done, everything looks good. And their lipid panels are fine. Their glucose is fine. Their blood pressure is fine. And it ha- it's directly related to the amount of muscle mass they have. So it has this protective effect. So we want to promote autophagy, but we don't want to lose muscle mass. And then we want to encourage muscle mass for recovery and longevity. So even when people have prime glial cells, it's a good idea to build muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you feel like the symptoms are a good enough indicator that you've healed or you've primed those glial cells or like uh, is is more testing required or or when they start to feel better, you know that you're getting there? So the only way you can clearly see they have prime glial cells is if you do PET scan studies where they use different uh, fluorescent agents to see the glial cells prime. And that's not commercially available for like clinicians. That's what they're doing at research universities. But you just make the assumption from their symptoms in a real clinical world and, and, and the fact that it's there. And then what you'll see is they start to improve is when they get exposed to milk, maybe they completely lost focus, attention, concentration. And now it's like, it's only half as bad. 
Sure. And then it gets to now it's only 25% as bad. And now they're not even reacting to it. Mm-hmm. And now they also notice the focus, attention, concentration is improving. So that's how you know that you're probably heading the right way. Cool. Right. And it, so some of the structural uh, changes that occur in the concussed brain, they are reversible if we have the right intervention, or are you basically creating collaterals? Uh, so, so the neurons can always branch over. So neuron plasticity, right? So if you can increase BDNF growth factor, uh, right, you can always have a neuron branch over an injured neuron and regain function. The glial cells that was 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 ramified and gets ambulated, gets primed, that's there. You want to get rid of that? You got to get trigger autophagy. Right. So you want trigger autophagy to get rid of it. And then if you want to get those neurons to connect, you have to activate that specific area of the brain, which is what brain rehab is all about, right? Mm-hmm. So right. if they can't walk straight, you have them try to walk straight. If they can't bounce on their foot, you have them bounce on their foot. And the, and the basic way of looking at neuro rehab is what can't you do? Great. That's your protocol. Sure. But at a rate that you can handle without totally getting exhausted. Right. Like for some people, they go look to the left. They're like, oh, it causes a headache. Okay. Only look to the left this far. Okay. I can do it. Do three. Okay. Great. No problem. Do four. Oh, that's too much. I get a headache. Great. You're going to do three. Right. You can do, and then how often do I do it? I don't know. Wait 10 minutes. Do it again. Oh, 10 minutes is too early. I get a headache again. Great. Try 20 minutes. And then you figure out what their mitochondrial function endurance is based on their individual unique response. So now you're having to do therapies specific to the things they can't do at a rate that isn't exceeding their rate. And then you promote autophagy, right? And then if you do things like exercise, you change things like BDNF. And BDNF is directly linear correlation with the intensity of the exercise. So you have someone raise their heart rate like for three to four minutes and then do brain rehab and then start showing autophagy. That's how you recover someone's got a brain injury. One of the knocks on functional medicine, Datis, has been that, you know, we need all this elaborate testing. So how do you reconcile with your patients, when, you know, especially if maybe you have a financial hardship or, or something like that? Uh, you know, do we need all this, you know, elaborate testing to start to start our intervention no. or? Yeah. No. So I have a, I have an institute called the Cross Institute. We have about 3,000 practitioners taking classes in it. And we try to teach them, like, how to do functional medicine. And as we're very clear, like, when you're bad at functional medicine, you you're test testing. everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you give them every supplement. <laughs> right. So you can almost look at the quality of the functional medicine practitioner, how precise they are with their testing, and how precise they are with the nutraceuticals. And people that are new tend to order way too much stuff and and add a test pressure and try to treat everything at once. And then people that are more skilled will be able to like, fine tune it. And what I mean by fine tuning it is they're finding the, the variables that will hit all the other parts of the web, right? So then if I do this thing, it's going to impact this, 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 and this, and this. So I'm going to start here. Mm-hmm. You know, it might be like, I just need you to get to sleep. Uh, we, we can't get anywhere past this. We get someone has like hepatitis C and they like have all this chronic viral response. You're like, I'm not going to even try to support your immune system because nothing is going to happen. You're only going to get your immune system activated when you get some sleep and you have sleep issues and your sleep issues are sec- secondary to your hypoglycemia. So let's stabilize your blood sugar for the next month. Let's make sure you can sleep. And then once you start to sleep, we can move on. And then usually you'll see like their, their viral activity levels go down, the white blood cells go up, and then you can do the next intervention where someone may be inexperienced be like, you, your immune system is messed up. I got to measure your food sensitivity panel and I got to look for pathogens and I got to do this. And I need to give you 10 different supplements to approach your immune system. And it's like, it's all failed, uh, failed outcomes because they didn't actually get to the primary thing. So that's the main difference between like someone who's good at functional medicine and someone who's more experienced. They can kind of see the relationships. And speaking of relationships, what's the relationship with functional medicine in athletic performance, it's really not talked about a lot. I mean, we talk about, you know, our patients that are sick or have autoimmunity, but what about, I mean, a lot of us, you know, we're dealing with, you know, whether it's a professional athlete or a top athlete, they're needing their body to perform like a Ferrari. And right. there's so many things that you could be diving into to be, you know, oh, yeah. to helping with this. And I think it seems to me like uh, our field has a really difficult time thinking that like, uh, when we deal with musculoskeletal problems, that the cause or the root of the problem may not be like, or it could be from some other system of the body, whether that's tension, tone, trigger points, joint blockage, that can also have uh, like a visceral, you know, uh, cause to the problem. So yeah, 
Yeah. Could you comment on, you know, when you're working with high level athletes and, you know, what are some important things to look for and, you know, what, what the world might be missing in that world? Oh, I'll mention a couple of things uh, to answer a whole parts of those, that question. One is like most functional medicine practitioners are in the trenches dealing with people that don't fit disease models and they're patient sick and they're not really working with a lot of athletes. Sure. There are people who specialize in athletes, but just so you know, like it's for someone to come into a functional medicine practice. So why are you here? I just want to perform better. You're like, what? Really? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that would be really cool. <laughs> it's not, it's not a common thing that happens in a functional medicine practice, right? You typically it's like, I have depression. I have fatigue. I can't function anymore. I'm exhausted. I'm in pain all the time. Like that's the typical chronic. And I, and I have worked with athletes and living in San Diego. I was working a long time with a lot of uh, triathletes and Ironman athletes and, and I never will again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're uh, they're not fun to work with. They're absolutely not fun to work with, and uh, that's just me personally, right? Sure. In the right. experience, I, but I th- but because these were like super over the top, like you know, and, and uh, no, trust me, we know they were like yeah. they, had, they had they had you know they weren't healthy. They had an addiction to over and they were prone to being over training. Yeah, it's now, let's drug. Take the, yeah, let's take the average person though, not the extreme you know person, extreme athlete. Um, yeah, the, one of the biggest issues overtraining syndrome. The, the, you know, the key thing is overtraining syndrome is, a, you know, a common thing in sports medicine and metabolic overtraining syndrome is an actual t- diagnosis code. And it's when people start to um, lose performance from their same routine. So the biggest clue is that someone's getting overtraining syndrome is if they're running, they can't run as long. If they're in a certain amount of reps, they can't do it as much. They start to get depression. So instead of the performance going up, performance starts to get stable or go down. So that's metabolic overtraining syndrome. And then researchers have looked at what's happening with metabolic overtraining syndrome. And they're seeing high amounts of interleukin-6. That's like the predictive marker to determine. And when they look at people like the finish marathons, they look at how they recover and not recover. It's very clear they can use interleukin-6 levels as a predictive marker of you're going to be in bed for the next 10 days or you're going to probably recover in a couple of days of how well their body's adapted to releasing this mediator. And this mediator is inflammatory. Uh, it's a stress response. So IL-6 is what they call pleiotropic cytokine. It has defects on different systems throughout the body, but it activates the HPA axis for the stress response, but it also activates uh, the immune system triggered the inflammatory, like NFKB response and so forth. So um, a fun- goal of the functional medicine practitioners go, let's avoid you from getting metabolic overtraining syndrome. So you might want to look at their cortisol levels, make sure their cortisol levels are not high. And if they are, maybe you adjust with their training. Um, you want to look at their resting heart rate, see what's happening with that. You want to see what their glucose resiliency is. So a lot of functional medicine people are using um, continuous blood glucose markers. They could see sometimes that there's certain trainings, their glucose just stays high. Mm-hmm. They even get insulin resistant hours and hours and hours afterwards, Like, which is a sign that they probably had too much stress physiology released than what they're adapted to. So they'd want to calm that level down. So looking at cortisol and continuous glucose markers are really good ways. Looking at just systemic inflammation of how they feel, how their pain is, their mood. And then ultimately, the healthier you can get them, the better. There's direct relationships between overtraining syndrome and then starting to get leaky gut syndrome <laughs> and intestinal permeability. There's direct uh, there's studies that are now show the microbiome changes during exercise and overtraining syndrome. <laughs> so people's guts become more sensitive. So, you know, you maybe try to optimize your gut biodiversity, try to support leaky gut, maybe give them adaptogens, make sure the blood sugar stability is okay, make sure they're not getting any spikes. So if, if they can find a functional medicine person to work with, I think it really improved their... Well, I think too, I mean, you see like, I mean, almost like widespread microcytic anemia in, in our athletes. And and I think sometimes you think, well, okay, so we supplement with iron, but without the... I guess the, the knowing that how microcytic anemia can affect literally every cell of your body and like understanding the relationships there, there's so much, you know, in that world, even that I feel like in, um, the people that are working with the athletes, they, they really are, they're missing this huge window of why the, the athlete is chronically injured. Yeah, and microcytic anemia in athletes is not iron deficiency; it's inflammation. Right. They make sure that the ferritin and transferrin levels, uh, insoluble transferrin markers, will be very clear. It's not iron deficiency; it's, it's anemia of chronic inflammation. So they just got to get their inflammation load down. You get your inflammation load down, or you get your adaptation to stress and inflammation up. So higher amounts of antioxidants, reducing chemical load. You know, those are the things that can improve resiliency. Uh, 
to that. Uh, but it's with, definitely not iron. Actually, iron could make it much worse if they're not actually iron deficient. That's exactly right. For sure. What about then uh, on the, along those lines of trackers like Whoop and Aura Ring and these other things that are kind of making their waves of telling people Great. green, yellow, red? Do you feel like those markers are good to, to, to balance over training or do you feel like they're maybe missing some things that could be, be involved with those? So I'll be honest with you until I don't know because I don't use them. Sure. I deal mostly with head injuries and autoimmune disease and chronic inflammation. I don't have uh, yeah experience with that. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel that heart rate variability is a way to maybe is the best way to see like balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system? Cause the world's basically trying to tell us that's a case. Maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, do you know any different way or do you use heart rate variability? Well, there's definitely studies that have shown heart rate variability increases all cause mortality. So if you're in a, and especially if your heart rate's higher than normal and it, it has variability, you for sure have increased risk for all cause death. Right. All cause mortality. So there is something there. Um, uh, so I think there's definitely um, – I, I think it exceeds their, their ability to dampen their stress response for sure. That's an autonomic sympathetic response. And if we see that with like dilated pupils and we see like, like abnormal sweating responses and heart rates up, we're like, okay, that's this, this autonomia. That's, right. That's, that's, that's not normal. <laughs> right. Definitely. Definitely. Beautiful. Well, uh, I just thank you again for sitting down with us, number one. But uh, if if we have functional medicine doctors out there, if we have people like us that are looking to learn more from you, what, what's the best way to, to find more about you, number one, and then uh, to, to, to get involved with courses and uh, your mentorship program? So uh, for practitioners, uh, healthcare professionals, uh, we have the Krasian Institute. My last name is very long, K-H-A-R-R-A-Z-I-N Institute. <laughs> Uh, Cross Institute. So I have courses for healthcare professionals. And then we also have a clinical mastership program where we, we have ground rounds and go through live cases in that program. And then for people that um, are just interested in, in not deep training, but just information on health related topics to autoimmunity inflammation and information that's very, it's less, less practitioner based. Uh, I have a whole website that, with lots of articles and podcasts and everything called Dr. K News, drknews.com. Beautiful. He's also written, uh, I know of two books, your uh, Why Is My Brain Working? And then also yeah. a thyroid disorder book. So you've you, there's right. two books that you've officially written, I think? or Yeah, sure. we have two books uh, you can find on Amazon uh, if you search my name. And then uh, we're trying to finish our third book right now. I know everyone, everyone says they're trying to finish their book, but I actually, actually <laughs> you have actually the printed are. You version. Actually are. I, I, have, I have the printed version now. It's just like, that's, yeah. that's really close then, damn. <laughs> you know, every time someone, oh, I'm working on a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard that four years ago. <laughs> Well, I think too, Datis, uh, in the world that is a little bit like the wild, wild west, which is what nutrition and functional medicine kind of is, you have been the voice of reason. And I think that, you know, that, that is what the world needs. Cause I think the people that get exposed to functional medicine in the right way, you got to think it's the future of medicine. I mean, you just have to think that. So, uh, I think, you know, you're one of your greatest contributions is, uh, really bringing credibility to functional medicine because, uh, there can be a weirdness that you know exists around it uh so i would like to personally say thank you for that and uh i again i mean when i've been you're a tough guy to get pinned down i mean you're kind of like cornering a badger trying to get you uh, on our, on our podcast, but, um, I knew how critical this was. And even like in our long list of, uh, great people we've had on our podcast, I mean, this is going to be one of the more important ones because it's going to expose all our listeners to how important functional medicine is. Well, thank you for, for exposing functional medicine to everyone. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I'm assuming what, I mean, what is the future? I mean, what is, you know, what you hear about a lot is like the futures in regenerative medicine, stem cell, PRP, that world. What's the future of functional medicine? What does that look like 20 years from now, 50 years from now, down the road? I think it's just going to um, get more fine tuned. It's going to evolve more. I think as as uh, people start to embrace personalized lifestyle medicine as an option versus just generalizable medicine, it's going to become more popular and more mainstream. And uh, I think uh, we'll have better research done with it. And uh, I, I just see optimism with it. I think it's going to it's going to flourish. What uh, one final thought I want to ask you: How do we reconcile the thought of compliance with all these changes we need to make? You know, with the, with our patients. 
Is that at this point in your career, is that a struggle of yours? I mean, people wait a year to see you. So I'm assuming by the time they get to you, they're ready to make some changes. But the people that are out in the trenches in everyday functional medicine, I, th- I know one of the knocks is it's hard to get our patients to comply to all the changes we're asking them to make. And it's hard for them to do it over a period of time. Can you give us some inspiration on <laughs> how we all can be better at that? Well, I would say a couple of things. First of all, compliance is a brain-related function. So compliance is frontal lobe and dopaminergic, all right? So there's some people who have like severe depression, focus attention issues, concentration, history of not following through and finishing tasks. That's dopamine related. So that's, that's that's first of all, it's diagnostic. So when someone doesn't comply, <laughs> like when you see a history and they go, wow, you've seen this person? They're fantastic. You've seen this person? They're fantastic. Why are you here? Like these people are phenomenal. Uh, I don't know. And you get down to it, they just couldn't follow through and get through with their protocols. So that's one thing. Um, and then the other part of it is there's just going to be patients that are not ready to go where you need them to go. Like I can tell you, I have patients and I have this huge like plan, step one, step two, step three, step four. And we get into like step three and they're like, you're the best. See you later. And you're like, oh, <laughs> we haven't started there's, yet. there's a level of like, oh, I'm, I'm happy with where I am. Thank you. And the amount of effort, energy, time put into it is not worth what the next step outcome might be. And that's it. Um, and I, I think that's part of it. And then the other part of it is there's people that are not good at functional medicine. So they actually totally suck and the patient is getting outcomes and they don't comply. And they, then practitioners don't take a look at themselves and go, maybe it's my skill level. And maybe I'm at you know, the right diagnosis and maybe I'm not communicating with them. So it's a combination of, I think, like actual dysfunction and some people that can't have a hard time with complying because it's frontal lobe dopaminergic and some of it being the practitioner doesn't a great job but the patient isn't ready for it and some of it being the practitioner doesn't realize that they're the ones who really suck and they can't <laughs> communicate the message and they're expecting way too much because they're not giving in the platform to read i would say that would be more than half mm-hmm, right. i say they just don't have like i can tell you like if i have a new graduate if you look at a new graduate doing a functional medicine workup and talking to a, a chronic patient and then you have a seasoned functional medicine, giving him the exact same diagnosis and approach. I will guarantee you, without doubt, the seasoned practitioner is going to have better outcomes. Yeah, sure. you- they're going to they're go in there and say, you know, the new practitioner is going to go. I, I well, I think you should try, and I think you need to, and I, I want you to. Let's see how you do with that. And the seasoned practitioner is going to be like, hey, this is what you need to do. And there's that sense of like souls connecting, and they're like. Okay. Yeah. And you know what we want to call that? <laughs> Jedi power Jedi power or something. Yeah, like right. It's not experience. I think I think there's just a part of practitioners that are having frustration with it is like you just have to also build your uh self-confidence, which is perceived by your patient. Mm-hmm. And they can they can tell like you're not really sure. Versus like <laughs> I've seen this like I've seen this enough times. This is like pretty clear. Just get this done, we'll go from there. And they see that tone you have and that honesty you have with them, and they're like I'm on. I'm in. Yeah. And I, so I, got, I got one more uh, pressing question I, I was wanting to ask you. What do you think about, like, there's a thought that, you know, every modern American who's trudging around the earth should be taking some blanket supplements, that being fish oil, vitamin D, 400 milligrams of magnesium. Do you believe that that is necessary and that's the case or case dependent or people would be safe to do that. I mean, it, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I can tell you, I think it's appropriate for me and my family and loved ones. I, I don't want to talk about the whole world, but if you take a look at, let's just say you just look at the evidence and forget your personal belief system, but you were just a hardcore researcher and say, what does the evidence really show? Right. There's no question in the world, like taking fish oils, has a profound impact on all forms of cardiovascular disease, all cause mortality. Not not one study. We're talking dozens and dozens and dozens of clinical trials where we have multiple meta-analyses done of clinical trials with composite scores going, yeah, it really makes a lot of sense for people to take fish oils, and that's the number one cause of death worldwide. So why not? Right. right. So so if you were just looking at the evidence, go, okay, if I'm gonna purely look at this as a researcher, I should probably take some fish oils. Okay. <laughs> And then if you take a little step, you go, okay, well, there's an enormous amount of data on antioxidants and flavonoids. And if you're just looking at the data, you go, I probably should take at least the two most published ones versus veritrol and curcumin, right? And I'd say there's some pretty good evidence on just a multivitamin in general, right, as a preventative tool, especially for cognitive decline. 
this and lots of less information on cognitive decline, particularly. So I think you know people should take Sakis curcumin, resveratrol, uh, fish oils, just based on what's been published. Right, you know, yeah. and this and if you don't, it's okay too. But uh, <laughs> I think it's a good idea. All I heard from that is resveratrol. That means that we got to keep drinking wine. So <laughs> <laughs> more wine, more. No. Yeah, but the wine, uh, the the studies that do on resveratrol and wine is not significant enough. It's what they've actually found. The confounder was that they were social. That most people that are drinking and are not drinking in a dark room in the corner by themselves, they're interacting with loved ones and friends, and wow. that was the biggest factor. So, right. it's not friends are broad, <laughs> friends are broad word, but yeah, does, but that's you right. can have your wine <laughs> independent of it for your social response. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Is there any danger? I mean, most people that are dealing with athletes in here, I mean, we're going to get the question daily: like, is you know, supplements like creatine, things like that, is that safe for our young athletes? Do you have an opinion on that? If you don't, it's fine. I'm just curious if, because you're looking at creatine now, and I think uh, it's uh, improving memory, it's improving performance, it's per- performing cognitive skills besides athletic function also. So what do you, what's your I, thought? I personally don't have any problem with it. I think if you have a kidney disorder, you can be very careful with it. Um, that's pretty easy to tell. Right. You have it's high GFR, any kind of proteinuria. Um, someone takes and all of a sudden they start having foaming of the urine and having pain in the back of their kidneys or something. Stop. <laughs> other, other than that, your body can metabolize it and use this fuel very quickly. Uh, I don't see an issue with it. Yeah. Beautiful. Dottis, okay. thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy and we really, yeah. really appreciate your expertise, number one. And uh, we, we thank you for sharing. So uh, with that being said, guys, uh, Start exploring uh, these these types of things we talked about today with your patients that aren't responding. Even in musculoskeletal practice, uh, there's always another answer. And uh, I'll put all the the links to, to your information in the show notes, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Hopefully, we'll be able to meet you when we're in San Diego next time, all right? Yeah, that's good. All right. Thanks, thanks guys. Dante. Have a great day. Yeah. Bye, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gasol Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it. Subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.